the uh, Ring series. This is the last one in this mod, and I'm glad to see you all here. Uh, I think you're, you're in for a good ride. Uh, we are very pleased to introduce uh, uh, Jim Stein uh, to, uh, he's now the Chief Investment Officer of Ram Realty Services. Uh, after 25 years in another career we were just talking about where he uh, ascended to uh, considerable heights. He's currently in charge of new acquisitions and as you'll see in his presentation, this is a, this is a very serious firm, very substantial firm. And he's in charge of their new acquisitions, their dispositions, their development strategy. So he's, uh, he's carrying a tremendous responsibility with his organization. He previously was in the same role or a similar role with the Stiles Corporation, another very, very prestigious and uh, well-recognized uh, firm here in Florida. And there he coordinated their development, their leasing, their asset management, their property management. So again, his perspectives are, are rich and diverse, to say the least. He was president of the Stiles Capital Group, their asset management group, which is an area that I know interests a lot of you and uh, handled project financing, acquisition, and disposition of assets. So he's the kind of guy who, he, he is, he's one of the guys who did what I think many of you think of as a really interesting uh, undertaking. Uh, altogether, he was <coughs> able uh, something like a billion dollars in transactions in his career, uh, as that styles and how it uh, ran. He had a special role, uh, I think it's quite intriguing, of developing negotiation strategies in recent times for restructuring loans with lenders and banks, insurance companies, and so forth. So uh, again, he's been you know, on, on a front that I think is extremely interesting. Meanwhile, he's an active member of the Urban Land Institute, uh, NAOP, the National Association of uh, Investment and uh, Office uh, uh, Professionals, and uh, with the ICSC, as many of you are familiar with, and, uh, and ch civic uh, charity organizations. And we're proud to say he's a member of our advisory board and the current chairman, which gives you some idea of the group of respect and regard he has <coughs> in the industry. So, Jim, welcome to the Ring Series. And we're delighted Thank you, to Wayne. Be here. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it sounds so much better than it really is. Um, and I, I can't tell you all what, a, what an honor it is to be here today, to be invited to, to speak to, to all of you. I got to meet a bunch of you at the, uh, at the fall conference a couple of weeks ago and hope to meet more of you today. Um, but before, before we get started, I have to make a couple of disclaimers. Um, first of all, I've never, I've never spoken to or, or I guess lectured um, a room full of college students, um, so I, I can't tell you you know, how good this may or may not be. And, and secondly, um, when I was here as a student uh, from 78 to 82, I was not a good student. Um, so you might question a little bit uh, the validity of the edu education you're getting here uh, uh, today. You know, I, when I was here from 78 to 82, I was, I was focused on a lot of things. Um, and somewhere down the line was, was my education. I was up here on, on student loans. Um, I had a, almost a full-time job. I was working as a, as a bank teller at the, what, what is now the Bank of America branch down here on uh, University. Back then it was a, a great American bank. And, um, um, and I thought you know, it was very important to be a member of a social fraternity. So I, you know, I, I joined, a, I was an SAE here at, at Florida and, and lived in the house. So I had a lot of, a lot of different things going on uh, besides going to school. And, it was interesting, uh, we had our, our chairman's circle dinner um, when we were here two weeks ago and Rick Scarola and I were sitting at the, at the uh, dinner table across from Dr. Archer and, and um, of course we were here um, and, and had Dr. Archer's class and, and Rick asked Dr. Archer, he said, well, Wayne, do, do you remember either, either Jim or me from, you know, from class when we were here? And, and Wayne didn't hesitate, he said, no, <laughs> he said, not at all. So that, Kind of gives you a feel for um, you know the, the type of the type of students uh, we were, but I I think it's a um, you know, obviously I'm committed to this program. I think it's a wonderful program. I think it's wonderful that that you're all here, uh, that you're enrolled in this program. Uh, there's there's so much for you to learn from Drs. Ling and Archer and and, and Tim and and uh, um, and I think it's it's phenomenal that you know what you want to do at this point in your life. And I know a couple of you guys are. You know, you're using the program to kind of make a shift in your career, and it's a great, it's a great program for that too. So, um, uh, kudos to 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 all of you um, for that.
for that. Um, so, so I'm here from 78 to 82, not, you know, not a great student. So 82 rolls around, it's time to move on. And I don't have a clue as to what I want to do. You know, I don't know what real estate is. I don't know, you know, I'm just, I don't know what I want to do. My parents are kind of freaking out. And uh, so my dad, my dad was a banker. And so he said, you know, why don't you, you know, as a, you know go into banking? And, um, you know, they've got these, these credit training programs where you can, you can go in and you can be a credit analyst and you get exposed to different industries. You can, you know, you'll underwrite the financial statements of these, these, these companies that are uh, looking to procure credit from the banks. And, and so maybe, maybe if you do that for a couple of years, you can kind of get a feel, figure out what it, what it is you want to do. So uh, that's what I did. And um, I, was, I was lucky uh, because I got a job with, with, um, with Barnett Bank, which... Most of you in this room, maybe, maybe you remember Barnett Bank. Um, you know, it doesn't exist today. It's, it was actually acquired by Bank of America, but at the time, it was, it was the biggest bank in the state of Florida. And we didn't have, you know, there was no such thing as these, these multinational, international banks. It was, you know, you had large regional banks and you had community banks, and, and, and Bank of America or, or Barnett Bank was a large regional bank. Um, so I went to work uh, in Fort Lauderdale with, with Barnett, and, um, and sure enough, uh, as a credit analyst, I was getting exposed to all these different companies and all these different businesses that were, that were headquartered in, in South Florida. And um, um, so, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd spread the financial statements, we'd, we'd help put the loan packages together, we'd go to loan committee with the loan officers, and we'd make the presentations trying to convince the loan committee that these credits were good credits for the bank. So that was great experience, and, and through that, that um, that process or that experience, I, I figured out that real estate was what I was interested in. And this is, so this is, you know, this is 83, 84. Um, tax laws were such that, you know, you could, you could write off 100% of the depreciation and the interest. And so there were huge flows of capital coming into real estate. It's the time that the, the syndications were created. And so it was, it was the hot thing, you know, and South Florida was, was booming. So, um, so, I, I, was, I was focused on the real estate and, um, and eventually was promoted to become a loan officer. So I was a commercial real estate loan officer for a couple of years. And, um, and so I was the guy who was out there, you know, trying to sell the bank and, and, and bring the loan business in. And through that, did that for a couple of years. And I, and I learned in, in that time that the large bureaucratic bank system, the, the, the large company was not for me. I didn't like it. You know, I saw some of my peers who were, who were being promoted and advancing through the bank, and, and it wasn't necessarily because of anything they were doing. They weren't necessarily doing a good job. They were just sort of, you know, brown-nosing the right people, and, and it just, I didn't like it. So I knew I wasn't going to be a banker for long. And then in 1985, I got a phone call from um, a fellow by the name of Greg Galetka, who was the, the chief executive officer at the time at Stiles Corporation. And I had no idea who Stiles was. He'd gotten my name from somebody else, called me up, said, would you like to come interview? I went and interviewed, and I walk in. And so it's 1985, and, and they're a young company, a bunch of young guys running this business. They're, they're just completing the development of the first master-planned office and industrial park in South Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. It's called Corpus, Corporate Park at Cypress Creek. You know, so this was you know, a couple million square feet of office space and industrial. They'd just taken down 125 acres of land in, in North Palm Beach where they're going to start another master planned office park. They were in the process of acquiring 600 acres in southwest Broward County. And so this guy's telling me all this stuff. And I'm, I mean, before he even told me what the job description was, I was like ready to take the job. You know, I was, I was ready to go. And um, so the, the job was they, they needed somebody to come in and, and, and handle the relationships with the banks because they're going to need large amounts of capital, not just equity, but debt as well. And so they wanted somebody to come in and handle the bank relationships and procure the construction financing. And so, you know, I, I left there, and he said he'd get back to me. I think two weeks went by. It felt like two months. And um, finally I get the call. He says, come back. I want you to come in and meet a couple of the people here. Came back and met Terry Stiles, the owner, and a couple of the other executives, and, and all that was. But I spent the next 25 years of my life at, at the Stiles Corporation. I mean, basically I spent half of my life uh, working uh, at the Stiles Corporation for Terry Stiles. And when I say it was fortuitous, um, you know, I, I, I was pretty confident that I was getting on with a good company, a company that had great growth prospects. Obviously, I just told you all the things that they were working on. 
what I didn't understand at the time, uh, 25 years of age, was that um, this guy was just, you know, I mean, he had the ultimate character. I mean, this guy, everything he did was, he did it with the thought of how is this going to affect my reputation? I mean, he was really concerned, and to this day, really concerned with his reputation. And so, he was surrounded by people. This, this company was, was built with people just like him. And so, I bring that up uh, because I've, I've been a, a mentor to a number of students over the years, and one, one, one piece of advice that I've given to every one of them is that as you're coming through this program and you're starting to, you know, you're interviewing companies, right? You're, you're meeting the guys on the board, you know, you're looking at companies that, that, that aren't even associated with, with the board. When you look at these companies, dig in and, and understand what their values are. You know, what, what drives them? What, what are their core values? What's important to them? Not just, not just their business and what they do, but what are those values and how do those values compare to your personal values? You know, are you, are you gonna be proud? You know, if you work for this company, are you gonna be proud handing out that business card and, and, and telling people, you know, I'm Phil Wiley with the Styles Corporation or, or, or whoever or, or, or not? Because if the answer to that question is yes, and you like the company and you like the people and you're proud of it and you're comfortable working there and you're comfortable going there every day, you're gonna like it. And if you like it, you're going to work your butt off. And if you work your butt off and, 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 you know, and you're all smart or you wouldn't be in this program, you're going to succeed. You're going to do great. So um, I think that's important. At least that's, that's something that's always been important to me. Um, so as, as Wayne said, I, you know, I, I worked at Styles for um, 25 years, started out in this finance director position, became an asset manager, eventually headed up asset management, and eventually became the chief investment officer for the company, and I headed up and directed all of our, our real estate investment activity for, for the last you know, 25 years. And then um, about two and a half years ago, um, a good friend of mine, uh, Casey Cummings, who is co-owner with, with, um, with Ram Real Estate, uh, co-owns it with his father, Peter, um, Casey and I got together and we were talking, and, and um, he was explaining to me you know, what the direction of that, what the direction was that he saw for Ram for the foreseeable future and where he wanted to go. And they were just about, you know, so this is 2010, we're just sort of crawling out of the recession. Um, and um, he felt like it was time for them to start the process of raising their, their third private equity fund. And he knew at that time, he was not only the guy who was responsible for raising all the, the capital for the company, he was also the guy who was putting all the real estate deals together. And he knew that he couldn't grow the company if if he was gonna be the guy that was doing all of that. So he either needed somebody that could come in and help him with the capital side of it, or he needed somebody who could come in and help put the real estate deals together, or put the real estate deals together. So one thing led to another, and um, um, he, offered, he offered me this position, and um, it was um, uh, without question the hardest decision that I've ever made in my life, the decision to leave this company that I'd been with for 25 years, that it was like family. I mean, Terry, Terry Stiles is like a father to me. Um, but Casey obviously thought it was a good thing for, for Ram, and, and I felt like at that point in my career it was a good time for a, for a new challenge to do, to do, to do something different. And, um, and as I thought about it for the Stiles Corporation as well, we were sort of top-heavy with senior management. We had a bunch of guys my age or older who, you know, were kind of sitting at the top that, that weren't going anywhere. And we had all these, these young people, all this young talent, many of them who are graduates of this, of this program, who you know, were coming through one of the worst recessions in, in the history of our, our country. And you know, unless, unless a, a, the economy is growing and business is growing and your business is expanding, there's no room for, for people to move up unless one of the guys at the top moves out. So I could also see where it was, it was a good opportunity for the Stylus Corporation to, to uh, for me to, to move on and to create room for some of the younger people. So that brings us to, to today, um, and that's, that's sort of my, my career in a nutshell. Ram, um, Ram Real Estate, um, we're a, a real estate investment company. Um, I don't know how much, maybe you know, Phil could probably tell you something about us. Uh, Phil worked for us for a couple of years. Um, but we are, we're a, a real estate company that's, in, that's focused in 
on multifamily and retail investment throughout the Southeast United States. And um, we do most of our investment through uh, private equity, uh, completely discretionary, commingled, closed in funds. And, um, um, and, that's, and, that, and that's part of what attracted me to this company as well, because Styles Corporation was, a, uh, was really a development shop, development and construction shop. We weren't really, we didn't have the ability to raise the, the, the private equity funds. Um, so, that's, so that's been a new sort of exciting thing for me. And so what I wanted to talk to you guys um, about today was, was um, real estate investment strategy. And, and I thought, you know, what better way to talk to you about that than to talk about Ram's real estate investment strategy. So unless anybody has any questions at this point um, with anything I've talked about so far, then we'll, we'll move into discussion about that. So what I want to talk about is um, what I think makes up a successful investment strategy. And um, I sort of I think of it as a, as a four-legged stool. Um, there's the who, what, where, and how um, of a successful investment strategy. And so what I mean by that is like any business, any successful business proposition, it all starts with the people. You've got to have a good team. You've got to have good, solid people, intelligent, hardworking people to execute a business strategy. So that's the who. The what is you've got to decide what it is that you're going to invest in. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, as you guys know, there's, you can invest in industrial product, retail, multifamily, office, hospitality, um, medical office. I mean, there's, there's a whole host of different product types. And I suppose there are some companies who, who do all of those or attempt to do all of those, but I think it's important to focus on, on one or two uh, product types and to, to really know those product types to be good. Um, and then there's the, the where, which obviously is, is geography. And, and I think just like you need to be focused on product type, I think it's important to be focused on on your markets and know, know the markets that you're investing in and know them better than your competition. And then lastly is the how. Um, where's the deal flow gonna come from? You know, how, how are you gonna source these investment opportunities? Uh, where's the product flow coming from? And so what I've, what I've got here today is, uh, I've taken a few uh, slides from, um, from our current pitch book and the pitch book is what we use when we go to meet with investors and we're trying to convince them that it's a good idea for them to invest their capital with Ram Real Estate. We're obviously selling them on our investment strategy and trying to sell them on the fact that we've got the who, we know the what, and we know the where, and we know the how. So with that, um, this, uh, this first slide is a slide that, that we use and, and basically what what, what this slide does is it allows us to, to describe the evolution of, of the company. And, and so, um, you know, what you see here is Peter Cummings, uh, he, he acquires a 2,000 acre parcel of land in, in Martin County in 1978 and develops that into Martin Downs, which is a, a master plan community. Uh, his son Casey joins the company in 1991 and, and the company starts to evolve from this, this, this single um, project into multiple projects where they're, they're buying and developing retail properties. And in, 19, in the mid-90s, they move into to multifamily development. And then, um, most, and at that time, most of these projects were relatively small. The, the, the capital, um, or the, the equity capital uh, component was, was primarily being provided by uh, family members and high net worth individuals. So as, as the company evolved and the projects got bigger, uh, we, needed, we needed more capital, so started to, to invest with uh, companies like Prudential. Um, so you see that in, in um, 2001 to 2005. And then in, in 2005, um, we raised our first private equity fund, and it was a relatively small fund. It was about $85 million, and it was all, all focused on retail investment. 2007, we raised our second fund, uh, Ram Realty Partners II, 
Uh, it was a $200 million fund, and this, this, this fund was, whereas the first fund was purely focused on retail acquisitions, this fund was, was raised to support all of our business activities. So that would mean retail, multifamily acquisition, as well as ground up retail and multifamily development. And then that brings us to today, uh, where as I just described, we're in the process of, of raising our, our most recent fund. And uh, we'll complete the capital raise on that fund um, in December of this year. We currently, uh, we have about um, $110 million of committed uh, capital. And um, um, I think we'll, we'll probably wind up at 130 to 150, something like that before we're done. Um, the, next, the next slide, um, so as I said, you know, the team, we, we talk to these investors and, and, and we're trying to convince these. In fact, let me back up. Just so, Does everybody understand um, what a, when I say uh, a private equity uh, commingled, fully discretionary fund, does everybody understand what that, what that is and, and the significance of that? So, so, so a commingled fund, um, you know, you've got multiple investors who, who are investing their capital. They're, 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 ming they're commingling the funds. Um, private equity, so, so the, the people who invest in, in our funds, we're not, you know, we're not registered. So the people who invest in the fund, um, we've got both private individuals as well as institutions. Um, and then the most significant thing, I think, to understand um, with, this, with this, this fund is the, is the discretionary aspect of it. So when these people invest their capital with us in these funds, they're giving us complete discretion over what we invest in. So now granted, we, you know, we sit down with them, we tell them, look, these are the markets we're investing in, this is the product type we're pursuing, but when we identify a property that we want to invest in, we've got, a, we've got six members of, of our investment committee, all employees of RAM, who decide whether or not we invest that capital and that money. The, the, the investors have no say in whether or not we invest that capital or what we invest it in. So that's a, uh, that's a critical component and, and, of, you know, and it's a, as you know, coming out of the, the last several years where so many people have been burned by, by investment schemes and the Ponzi schemers and so forth, it's a very difficult environment in which to raise that kind of equity. You know, most of the people, you know, everybody's interested in investing in real estate, but most of them want to have say in what you invest in. So, um, so again, when we sit down and, we, and we're meeting with these investors, the first thing want, they want to understand is who you are. You, are, you, are you trustworthy? Are you, you know, do you have a, a track record? And so this slide illustrates that there's eight, there's eight partners in the firm uh, with an average of 27 years of, of real estate experience each, and, and we've all worked together on average for, for 14 years. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the newbie. I bring the average way down, uh, you know, having been there just two years. But... Um, but it's an, it's an important part of the pitch. So um, the minimum is, is a million dollars, and we really, you know, there's some, there's some individuals who have invested for a number of years. Our preference would, would, not, would, would not to be that low, uh, but there's a number of individuals who, who keep coming back. And so, um, we just, we just hit a major milestone here in the last couple of weeks. We, we got our first pension fund. Um, the state of New Mexico Public Employees Retirement Fund just invested um, a large sum of money with us. And um, that's, a huge, that's a huge step for us because that, that opens up a whole new market of potential investors. Um, and, and that's really, that's the type of investor that, that we're targeting and that we'd really like to, to see more of. Uh, so this particular slide, all, all we're showing here is we're, we're, we're uh, explaining to investors that unlike a lot of companies in our business, we sort of handle everything in-house. We do, we've got development staff, asset management, accounting, marketing, legal, uh, in-house legal, ret retail leasing, multifamily leasing. So, you know, our pitch here is that if you invest with us, we're not one of these companies that's handling property management and leasing for a bunch of third-party owners. You get you, your investment gets all of our attention, and um, and it's also beneficial to us to have all these people in staff when we're underwriting a new investment. 
we feel like we've got better information than a lot of our competition does because we've got people on the ground. We're in those markets and, and we feel like we know the markets better and we know the properties better than, than a lot of our, our competition. Uh, this slide just, just sort of uh, illustrates our geography and you can, these are a bunch of different icons that indicate some of the different properties that we currently own. Um, and then, you know, obviously, uh, it goes without saying, when, when, uh, when you're sitting down with an investor and, and um, you're talking about uh, making an investment, they want to know, well, what, what am I going to earn if I, if I invest with you? And so we're, when, we, when we're targeting uh, properties, we're, we're always sort of underwriting to a, a high teens levered IRR. Um, so 17 to 20 percent is, is what we, um, we don't promise, but it's what, we, it's, what we, it's what we target. And then the red bar that you see there um, is an illustration of what our performance has actually been since 1996. Um, so we've, we've, we've achieved a gross levered IRR of approximately 36 percent and 55 realized transactions since 1996. So, Obviously, that's a great story to be able to tell, look, you know, this is what we're targeting, but we underwrite conservatively, we're conservative guys, and, and we really hope to, to double that, that target. So, as I mentioned, um, the, next, the next thing is what? You know, what, what are you going to, what do you invest in? What is it you understand? And so, our organization understands multifamily and retail product type. And um, so when, when, we, when we sit down and we're making the pitch, we, you know, we're, we're showing them research that supports why, why is it a good time to invest in retail or multifamily product. And so this, this slide just sort of shows you the relationship between uh, supply and demand for, for retail product over, you know, from the, from, for about 14 or 15 years. And you can see um, absorption is the black line. You can see where it, where it tanks in, in 2009. Um, and then gradually starts to, to come back up in 2010 and 2011. And then, of course, from there on, it's, it's all projections. But, um, you know, our, our part of our pitch is if, you know, we, we think that things are going to continue to improve economically, demand should com continue to improve. But we don't see, we don't see the starts. We don't see the, con the new construction coming. And so there's, there's, a, there's a good relationship between supply and demand for the foreseeable future. Uh, this, this, chart, um, this chart illustrates the amount of distressed real estate uh, that exists uh, today in the markets that, that we're focused in. There's roughly $20 billion of, of distressed debt uh, secured by commercial real estate, specifically multifamily and retail real estate in, in, the, in, the, in the markets that we target. And the reason that this is important is, is obviously when there's distress and, and sellers are forced to sell, the real estate is, is cheap by historical standard, and, it, and it's a good time to buy. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit later about how we're, how we're using or how we're getting to real estate investments through, through distressed debt. Um, and then this, this slide just um, illustrates the, the, um, the relationship between the 10-year treasury and, and retail cap rates. And uh, what you can see, um, the, or maybe what you can't see, is that historically the the spread between those two has been about 369 basis points. And if you look at 2006, 2007, you see it's compressed to 147 basis points. So that's when the market was going crazy and values were super inflated. Um, and then fast forward to April of 2012, and that spreads 523 basis points. So again, it's, it's just an indication that that the relationship between those two would indicate that, that real estate is, or retail real estate is relatively cheap on a historical basis. And then um, we move into multifamily, and, and if, um, for those of you who stuck around um, at the uh, uh, retreat a couple of weeks ago, the last, uh, the last session we had, uh, we had a panel of, of uh, board members, uh, two of which were Rick Scarola of Covenant Capital and uh, Dick Donnell of ARA, a couple of multifamily experts, and they were talking about the, uh, the multifamily market and why they think it's so good uh, and why they think it's going to be good for, for the foreseeable future. Um, and one of the things they talked about was this chart, and this chart illustrates the relationship um, between 
home ownership, the, the rate of home ownership, which is the red line, and then the, um, the number of starts, uh, construction starts for multifamily development. And if you remember what I think it was, was Rick who said, for every, for every 1% of home ownership decline, that means there's a million new, or people who don't want to own a home anymore, they want to be renters, there's a million new households created for every 1%. So the peak of home ownership when you know, the, the, CM, the, 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 the MBS market was, was flowing and people were getting zero down payment mortgages, it got to about 70%. It's back down now to about 65%, and most studies or projections predict that that's going to get down to 60 or you know, maybe 58%. So it tells you that there's a lot more demand coming for multifamily um, units, and, and you can see that, that there isn't, I mean, the, the construction starts are starting to pick up, but, but they're, still, they're still low on a historical basis. Here's, uh, here's the same chart that, um, that I showed you on the retail. You can see, again, the, the relationship between absorption and completions, and, and we put that little yellow arrow in there from 2010 to 2012, and you see that gap. That's just pent-up demand. That's, that's, you know, there's, there's more absorption than there are units out there, and so what happens? Rents, rents are escalating, right? So um, it's a great time to, to own multifamily real estate. And then here's, here's the, same, the same chart again, uh, the relationship between the 10-year treasury, relationship between the 10-year treasury and, um, and multifamily cap rates. Um, I think I told you that the, the spread um, narrowed on, on retail cap rates at the peak to about 143 basis points. With multifamily, it narrowed to 78 basis points. So, you know, now a lot of that, that's somewhat misleading because a lot of what was trading, you know, these multifamily apartment deals were trading not because they were multifamily apartment deals, but because these guys were buying them and they were converting, converting them to condo. So there was really, there really wasn't a relationship between cap rates and the, and the 10 year treasury in that period of time. But anyway, that, that spread today is 422 basis points. And on average over the last decade, um, it's been 278 basis points. So again, it's an indicator that, that, that maybe it's a good time to invest in, in multifamily. So the third leg of the stool is where, um, and again, I you know I think um, there's different groups who who invest all over the world. So it's not that it's not that it it can't be done different ways, but we think it's important to to have a focus geographically. And and uh, so while we say uh, you know we focus on the southeast, we really we really focus on on seven specific markets: Southeast Florida, Tampa, Orlando, Atlanta, Charlotte. Raleigh Durham, Research Triangle, and Nashville. Those are those are the, those are really the markets that that we like. And and part of the reason that we like those markets is um, the projected population growth in those markets, as well as job growth, is is very positive. So it's projected that you know over the next four or five years, the population in those markets will grow by about two million people, and one and a quarter million jobs will be added. So I'm sure. In the courses that you've had to date, you know the, the the biggest drivers of demand for real estate. It's all about population and it's all about jobs, right? I mean, if if there aren't more people and there aren't more jobs, you don't need more space. I mean, it's just it's just that simple. The, those are the drivers of of demand for for real estate. So um, we think these are great markets to be in, and and um, and that's why we're there. And then this this. Um, this slide, um, the story that we're telling here is, is we've got a couple of indexes, actually three. The black line, uh, or, the, or the, I should say the light gray line, if you can see that, um, the, gray, the, bright, uh, the, the, the light gray line that, that drops sort of to the bottom there in, in 2008, 2009, that's, um, that's the Green Street Index. And what that tracks is Class A, um, you know, very high quality trophy assets in the large coastal markets. So Washington DC, New York City, San Fran, LA, Seattle, you know, these, these, these dense urban markets. Well, those, those assets took, took the hit the fastest when we had the financial crisis. And then you'll see how they, how they pick back up. Those are the assets that, 
appreciated the fastest when, when the Fed started inflating um, asset values. And so um, the story that we're telling here is that while that's where the capital has been going for the past several years, if you look at that, the red line, the red line is, is Moody's apartment index and the dark line is Moody's retail index in the markets that we're focused in. So the story here is there's still a lot more appreciation to go in the secondary markets with the less than, than trophy assets because what happens is the capital's chasing these trophy assets to the point that you know they're buying these things at four caps, four and a half percent cap rates. So the yield is, is very thin. So the next thing that starts happening is they start looking for yield and they start going to the places where they can get yield. And so that's, that's what's gonna happen and that's what we're starting to see happen now in the markets that we invest in. And then um, lastly is, okay, so that's great. You've got, you've got this great team. Um, you're focused on retail multifamily. You're, you're focused in these, in these markets. How do, you, how do you find the deals? You know, where do the, where do the deals come from? And um, you remember that slide that showed $20, $20 billion of, of distressed debt. So one of the sources for, for, our, uh, for our investments is, is through distressed debt. And we subscribe, we subscribe to a service called TREP. Um, uh, and TREP is a service that all of the, the CMBS, all the special servicers to CMBS, they report to TREP what the status is of all of their loans. And so you can go on this trip and you can see if there's a loan that's either about to become distressed or is in distress and you can see exactly what the status of it is. And so we'll target those properties that are in distress. The second thing, um, or the second source that you see here is acquisition and repositioning. And what we're talking about there is properties that we can identify, um, you know, might be somebody that, you know, one of our people in Charlotte or it might even come through a broker, but it's a property that has been either mismanaged or perhaps, you know, the, the borrower is undercapitalized. They haven't, they haven't managed it the way it should be managed to maximize the value. Or perhaps it's a retail property where we know that Lowe's wants to be in this location and there's a shopping center that's got an empty box and we can go in and, and we can buy this property. We can bring Lowe's to the property and we can add value. So it's sort of our value add strategy. And then the, the third, um, source is, is what we call special situations. And so um, we'll provide equity to other real estate operators like ourselves that perhaps either they don't have access to the equity or they've got a deal that it's of a size that they don't want to put all the equity into the deal. So we'll, we'll put the equity into the deal and we'll actually co-invest with other operators. So a couple, a couple of examples of, of, um, of, of deals that, that, um, that we've done over the past uh, several years. This is this is what we call the Southeast Loan Portfolio, and this was a um, a portfolio of of distressed notes, um, uh, CMBS notes that LNR was a special servicer for, and they they brought this out to to market through Eastill. Um, Eastill secured um, marketed it, and um, we bought this pool of notes um, for uh, it was a sixty million dollar deal, and. Um, it was an interesting process because um, the special servicers, most of the information, they have, they have terrible information in their files about the properties. They don't know, they don't understand the properties that they've lent on. And so when you contract to buy property with them and you, and you start to do your due diligence and you go into their files, their files, they don't have anything. So, you, you know, you're, you're limited on the information you have. They only, they only gave us 30 days to, to do our due diligence and then we had to close 30 days after. So, a ton of work, you know, you had to go look at 38 different properties scattered throughout the Southeast United States, do your due diligence with, with not much information. That's the bad news. The good news is, because that's the process, there aren't a, lot, a whole lot of people that can do it or are willing to do it, so you don't have a lot of competition. So that $60 million that we paid um, for those properties represents a 75% discount to the replacement cost. So we bought them for 25% of the cost to replace those properties. Now, again, we were buying the notes. We weren't buying the fee interest in the properties. So we had to buy these notes and we had to work through the process of foreclosure or deed in lieu, or in some cases we worked, we worked it out with the borrower. We gave them a discount and they, they owned the property. Um, but it was, a, it was a tremendous discount. It was 40% of the face amount of the notes. So 
We bought them for 40 cents on the dollar for the face amount of the, of the, of the money that was owe, owed on those properties. So we're working through that, that portfolio now, and we've, we've, um, we've gotten title to all the properties. Uh, we're in the process now of, of disposing of them uh, one by one, and, and uh, we think uh, when we're done with this deal that it's gonna, it, we will have achieved about a 25% IRR, which is a, you know, a great, um, great return. The next deal, this is a, a property in, um, in South Beach, um, just a, a phenomenal location on Alton Road, um, just across the street, if you're, if you're familiar with, with South Beach at all, it's right across the street from the New World Symphony. And um, this is an example of a value add deal where uh, this property was, it was derelict. It was, I mean, it should have been condemned. Uh, there were people living in it, but it was rat infested, uh, just a, a complete mess. We, we bought the, again, it was a, a distress note deal that we bought for uh, $7 million, uh, which was about half of the, um, of the loan amount at that, that point in time. We invested another uh, six or $7 million um, Rehabilita rehabilitating the property, and, and these pictures you see here are, are post-renovation. Uh, um, we, um, we just sold this property in uh, the first quarter of this year. We sold it, we actually sold it to the New World Symphony, um, and this is where they, um, they house their, their fellows, their visiting fellows for the, for the orchestra. Um, and this deal, um, uh, we, we achieved about a 21% return on, on our investment here. And this is, I just threw this in. This is a, a copy of an article about that deal. Um, I don't know how many of you read the, the Wall Street Journal, um, but if you don't, you should. Um, and every, every Wednesday, there's a section in the, in the journal called the Property Report, and it's all focused on real estate. And they'll always have a, like a deal of the week kind of section, I think. Well, you know, our, our deal was the deal of the week. So, um, so that was kind of cool, and, and uh, we're kind of proud of that. And then, um, and then the last, you know, I, I, I talked about special situations. Uh, Jacaranda Plaza, um, again, this was a, a, a distress note, and this was a situation where um, uh, the borrower on this property had another property in, um, in Kendall in, in Miami that we had identified through that TREP service that I was explaining to you. Uh, they were, uh, you know, they were about to be foreclosed on, and so we reached out to them and, and uh, asked them if we could get involved with that deal and could we bring capital to help, you know, sort of resurrect the deal, and, and they, were, they were down the road, and, and, and they, didn't, they didn't want to do anything with us at that point, uh, but they said, we've got, we've got other problems that we can talk to you about a little later on, and so um, about six or seven months after having that conversation, that conversation um, auction.com, um, how, how many of you are familiar with auction.com? So auction.com is, is, is um, it's actually, I think, part, it's maybe 50% owned by L&R, but what it is, it's a it's a uh, auction service, uh, an online auction service, no different than eBay, um, that these CMBS uh, special servicers have established to allow them because they've got so much of this stuff. I mean, there's trillions of dollars of this of this bad debt, um, so they formed this this online auction process where they're actually auctioning off distressed debt and in some cases um, uh, REO or, or properties that they've taken back. And, and so what they do um, is they post these things online. You can, you can go in, you can, and they, they put a portal on there where they, they dump all their files into this portal. And if you're interested in bidding, you have to pre-qualify. Pre you have to post a, a $500,000 deposit. And, um, and once you've posted your deposit and they've approved you, then you can be, you're approved as a bidder uh, in this auction process. And, and literally the way it works is they, they'll start the auction process and you're sitting at your computer screen and there's a clock that's ticking down. It starts a day, a day or two in advance. The clock is ticking down and people are lobbing bids in on their computer. And you can see, you know, it'll say most recent bid $5 million and the clock's ticking. And so it gets, finally it gets down to the end and, and, and as you get close to the end, the, the bids start flying in and you're watching it go, you know, it's like bidding on a set of golf clubs actually. And it, and, and uh, so what's, what's interesting, what, what, what attracted us to this process is that not only do you have to post this deposit, but if you're the winning bidder on one of these properties, you've got like an hour to decide if you want it 
And if you decide that you want it, you're immediately at risk for 10% of your, of your bid amount. And you have to close 10 days later. So talk about weeding out a bunch of competition. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great process for buyers assuming that you understand the real estate. So this was particularly good because, as I said, this, this borrower, so they come to us once Eleanor decides they're going to auction their, their debt off. They come to us and they say, hey, you know, let's, uh, let's figure out a way to do a deal together. And so we sit down and we hammer out a, um, a joint venture agreement and, because they didn't have the capital to do it themselves. And so they owed, they owed $28 million on this thing. Um, they had information about the property that, that nobody else had. In, in particular, there was a, an inline CVS drugstore, and CVS was vacating and building a new store across the street. But these guys were working on a new lease with Family Dollar at a lease rate that was roughly five times the rate that CVS was, was paying. So having that information, you know, doing this sort of this special service, this, this sort of special situation where we were co-investing with these guys gave us a huge advantage um, in this particular case. And, and um, this one we bought, we bought for just under uh, $15 million, uh, which is about half of what it would cost to replace it today. Um, if you looked at the in-place income, um, it was about a 10% cap rate. To put that in perspective, had this property been, if, if the lender had taken the property back, if they had foreclosed on it, listed it with a broker and gone through the entire, you know, sort of the normal marketing process for um, a property where it's broadly marketed, this thing would have traded a, maybe a 7% cap rate. So about a 300 basis point spread between the cap rates. So um, we, we, we like those kind of situations. We like distress. We like, you know, we call these deals with hair on them. We like deals that have hair on them. You know, we like deals that nobody else is interested in because there's, there's inefficiencies in the marketplace and there's opportunities uh, to, to create substantial value. And then lastly, I just, I came across this, uh, this quote uh, the other day and I just decided to kind of stick this in here. Um, not because I'm, I'm liberal or a Democrat, um, because I'm not. Um, <laughs> but um, I, just, I just thought it was um, kind of interesting. Um, you know, real estate cannot be lost or stolen, cannot be taken away, purchased with common sense, paid, in, paid for in full. Now, you know, that's, that's low leverage. <laughs> I'm not advocating uh, uh, paid for in full. But, but the point is, and I think, and I think what, tr what attracts so many of us to, to real estate um, investment and as a profession is, is the fact that it's tangible. You know, I mean, you, you can see what you own. You can touch it. You can feel it. You know, it's not a stock certificate that you never see. You know, when you, you buy a stock, it's, it's in the ether somewhere. Um, and I just, I just kind of thought it was, was, um, was an interesting quote and decided to throw it in there. So um, that's it. Dave? Well, that was a that was just a particular situation. Okay. So that's not that's not that's not sort of a hard and fast rule. Um, that was just how L and R handled that particular situation. And um, you know, yes. Yeah, so to same question is you know why would a seller in any in any scenario why would you do that? And and the answer is that there is so much of this stuff. Um, I mean, you're talking literally you know, in excess of a trillion dollars of, of uh, distressed debt. They've got so much of it, they can't, they can't move it any other way. I mean, it, it, it's just not humanly possible, you know, to do it sort of, you know, one at a time. And so they just, they're pushing it out the door. Now, it's interesting because um, in the fourth quarter of last year, we made four new investments. Uh, three were distressed notes, and one was um, a property in Atlanta, a multifamily pro property that had been foreclosed on by the lender. And um, coming out of the fourth quarter of last year, I was, I was extremely confident that, that our business this year was going to be 
that kind of business, that we were going to be buying distressed debt. We saw more of it coming, and there's so much of it out there. We haven't done one deal this year. We haven't acquired one distressed note. And um, I think what we're seeing is that, that um, as these assets continue to, to reflate, you know, with everything that's going on um, in the economy and with, with, the, with the Federal Reserve, um, you know, printing, printing money effectively, that these lenders are realizing that, that it's to their advantage to hold this stuff on their books. So, you know, unlike 92 or 93 when we had the Resolution Trust, the federal government basically forced the banks to liquidate these, prop these, these, these properties or these loans. They're not doing that now. Um, so there were a lot of banks who, a couple of years ago, who were moving this stuff and they look at, they say, you know, we, told, we sold these, these notes to this guy at you know, 25, 30% of, of face amount. And then they see what the guy turns around and sells the property for two years later. And they're like, whoa, we made a mistake. You know, we should have we kept this stuff on the book. So, so that's going on. And, and then as it relates to the special servicer, these special servicers, they're earning fees. You know, as long as they are managing that, that debt, they're getting paid fees. So you've got two things going on there, right? You've got this issue of, well, I'm really not incented to, to sell the, the property because I think the asset's gonna be worth tomorrow than it is today, and plus I'm earning fees. So, so the volume has sort of kind of trickled. It's, it's kind of trickling out. I mean, there's, there's, still, some, there's still some stuff that they're selling. Um, but to a lot, to a large degree, it's it uh, the real estate is is just you know it's garbage. It's stuff that that we're not interested in. So, Bill? you uh, on one of your panels there, you, you mentioned about uh, investing in development. You know, putting that money back back out there to a third party. You also talked about kind of how hard it is to, to raise all the equity you've been raising. I was curious, kind of what proportion that is of your strategy, and how comfortable you are putting all that hard raised equity into into other people. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, um, we're only going to do it with people that, you know, that with stellar reputation. Um, and, and, I mean, the direct answer to your question is that, you know, maybe 25% maybe of, of, the, of the equity that we've raised will in, invest in those type of situations. Um, but we'll only do it with, with the best of the best. We're not, um, it, it's not, I mean, it's a great way to invest. I mean, if you, can, if you can find the right operators, you think about what it means for our company, if we, can, if we can invest with another operator, we don't have to use our human resources. It allows us to do more. It's a, it's a great way to leverage that capital. Um, but I don't, I don't see us doing more than about 25%. Leverage your funds uh, on average about sixty five percent. You know, the, I think um, I mean the max that um, you know or, or the fund is actually restricted. It's part of the it's part of the terms of the fund. Uh, I think the max we can do is seventy percent, but um, very rarely do we do that. Oftentimes it's sixty. Uh, just it just sort of depends on on the asset, but it's relatively low leverage. Not as low as FDR. Um, <laughs> would, would propose, but, but low leverage. So you buy these distress notes, and then you have to work out the foreclosure and whatnot. How long does that take? Does it cost a lot? What's the typical? That's a great question, um, and it and it varies by state. Um, Florida is, is one of the worst. Uh, it's a it's a debtor state. The the law favors the borrower. Um, so, in Florida, it can take. Um, you know, it could, it could take as long as two years. Uh, we've got we've got one uh, one note that we acquired down in Miami Beach, not Alton Point, but a, a different one, and um, we we acquired that note in 2009. We still don't have title to the property, uh, so a lot of it depends on the borrower and whether or not you know it, it, you know. Some people are, are good, honest people, and you know they recognize they've got they made a mistake, and the property is worth less than the debt, and they'll 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 turn the keys over to the lender, and and, and they're done. And then there's other people who they'll throw up every legal obstacle that they can to hold on to it. They file bankruptcy, um, and, and all that stuff drags it out. 
in a state like Georgia, it's like 30 days. I mean, it's it's all about the lender. You don't, you know, you don't, you miss a payment, uh, you're in default, lender takes the property back. Um, well, it's not so much that the property is, is worth less, but what we're forced to do when we underwrite um, a deal in Florida, we have to assume the worst case, right? Unless we know something, unless we've got a, unless we know the borrower is going to work with us and they're going to give us title to the property. Um, so we have to, you know, when we, when we run our cash flows, we're dumping legal fees and time and and, and all that stuff gets baked into the number, so it it does drive the value down, right? I mean, it, 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 you can pay less because it's gonna it's gonna be more costly and take more time. Um, but that's how we that's how we address it. You mentioned special service a couple of times. Why don't you explain if you would the CM, just quickly CMDS and the regular service or any special service you get involved in? Yeah. So. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm probably not the, the best person to, um, to give that, that um, explain that, but, but effectively with, with CMBS, um, you know, these lenders, they, they securitized the loans, right? So they took the stuff out and they sold it to the public. You know, they took a, took a loan and they break it up into pieces, no different than effectively the, I mean, with the stock with the company. Um, and so they issued bonds so the bond, you know, the people who buy these these loans, they're issued bonds, um, and then there there are companies. Um, there's the master servicer, and, and so let me back up. So these bonds then are then are graded, right? They're the, the the bonds at the top of the stack that are sort of behind, you know, in the back. If you think about a loan that, you know, the first the first dollars are secured, they're the most secure dollars because you know if the property was worth Fifty dollars on the day that you made the loan, and it, and it declines to twenty-five dollars in value. But, but you're you're in that bottom part of the stack. You're still in good shape. The the last dollars, and what they call the, the B tranche, because they, they break it down into tranches. That that B tranche is the is the riskiest part of the stack, and and the stack is is priced based on where it sits in the stack. So the less risky stuff, you know, might earn a three percent return, and the and the stuff at the top might earn 10 or 12. So just, just by way of example. The special servicers are the guys who bought the B tranches. They're the guys who bought the risky piece. And for that, what they get in, in exchange for that is, is when the loan goes into default, they sort of, they sort of take over. And, and they've got all the decision-making authority. They decide, you know, who the property manager is, who the leasing people are, are we going to foreclose, are we not going to foreclose, and they, and they, can, they can basically wipe everybody else out. Um, that's what LNR does. LNR has made a, a fortune doing that, you know, buying these B pieces. Uh, because as I said, you know, while, they're, while they're in that special servicer position, they're, they're, they're earning massive amounts of fees. I mean, they're just they're making a ton of money. And then if they, you know, if they can hold on to the property long enough, and, and the property, you know, the, the value of the property comes back, they make money in the real estate as well. Um, so I don't, I don't, that's, I mean, that's kind of a rough explanation, but layman's terms, uh, that's, that's sort of how it works. Um, in terms of uh, pension funds being ideal investors, do you have to change your investment style to deal with the pension fund? Or what would be the greatest challenges to, to having it? Um, we don't, we don't have to change anything. Um, you know, I guess um, wh what does happen is, is um, if an investor, whether it's a pension fund or, or whoever, you know, if you're, if you're raising two hundred million dollars of equity and one investor is willing to put up seventy-five million or hundred million, a, a, a large chunk of the, of the capital. They'll they'll no, they'll negotiate uh, the terms, you know, sort of the fees you can charge. Um, um, they'll have voting rights, 
you know, because there's, we, you know, we have an advisory board within the fund and there's a certain number of investors that sit on the advisory board. Um, so they, they can sort of negotiate better terms for themselves. Um, and that's not, that's not because they're pension funds, it's just because they're, you know, they've got large sums of money um, and, and they can make larger investments and, and get more control. I mean, the thing, the, things that, the thing that's attractive to us, and the reason I said that, that we want more of those investors uh, is because they do, they can write bigger checks. Um, and historically, if you, if you do a good job for them, if you, you know, if you deliver, um, you know, they're, they're asking you, well, you know, when's the next fund? And so it's, um, you know, it's just a great relationship to have uh, from, our, from our perspective. Do you see RAM getting more in, into institutional investing? I guess uh, into investing for institutions. Uh, yeah, I do, and and, and um, that's why the um, um, you know landing this this pension fund, getting this this first pension fund. It's always sort of you know no, nobody nobody kind of wants to be the first one in, you know. Uh, so you get the the first one in, and and then you know. They've got relationships with other pension fund advisors, and, and so you know, it kind of kind of gets your foot in the door, and, and it, it uh, creates opportunities to to uh, to attract uh, other investors. So um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, our, our objective is to to do more of that. And, and you know, and, and and what's really attractive about this whole um, I mean, there's a lot of things that are attractive about the fund investing. It, it's it's hard work. I mean, it's I mean, we're, we're traveling, we're on the road, it's, it's, it's hard work pitching. Uh, you might meet with five different groups every day for a week. Um, but it's, it's um, for, a, for a company like ours, for this, you know, for a, a family, you know, we started out as a family owned business, talked about the evolution of the company. Um, having a capital source like that, um, you know, it's it's just a it's a it's a it's a phenomenal way to sort of sustain the company going forward. You know, as opposed to um, like so many of these 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 privately owned development companies, it's started by a guy who's who's extremely successful, amasses you know large large amounts of wealth, and he's he's making bets. He's the guy that's putting the money in these deals. Well, eventually that guy isn't there anymore, and and typically the company. You know, it's not around after, you know, maybe, maybe it sur survives one generation. Um, but having this, this, uh, this, source of cap this, this source of capital like this where you've got institutions who want to invest with you who are looking for the next fund, um, it, it makes you much more sustainable as a, as a company, in my opinion. Tim? So. Uh, you know, it, it's um, the first um, the first two funds we use an advisor. Uh, you know, effectively a, a broker, if you will, um, you know, with a, uh, somebody who's got a Rolodex <coughs> who can make those introductions. Um, we're not doing that with this fund, um, so it's it's you know once you've once you've kind of done it twice and you've, you've met a lot of these people, um, you know, you sort of have your own Rolodex. Um, so we're, we're, we're doing it on our own uh, this time. What about the debt? Uh, the debt, uh, we do all that. I mean, we'll, we'll um, you know, the debt is sort of done on a project by project basis. So, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I think our, our largest uh, lender relationship right now is Wells Fargo. Uh, we're doing a ton of stuff with them. Uh, but we do this with life companies. Um, not crazy about CMBS. We do a little bit of CMBS. Um, we've got um, we've got two properties under contract right now. Two um, uh, an apartment project in Raleigh and another one in Orlando. And, and those two deals have have Freddie Mac loans on them currently. Um, and we're just gonna we're gonna assume those. So it's you know it's a broad array of uh, different debt providers. And, okay, and sometimes we, we go direct, and sometimes we use mortgage brokers. Um, you know, to help us sort of get the best deal. You mentioned you've seen a across, I don't remember, over the past five years or so, you've seen a gross IRR of around 36% on, on the deals. Um, what type of return do your investors see? 
So um, that's a great question. Um, they they would see they would they would see a return that is is um, roughly comparable. Um, and it just depends. You know, those were deals. So many of those deals were were the the deals that were structured with institutions. Um, so it would just depend on you know the how that every deal is structured differently with a different waterfall, different prep. Um, but they would they would typically see something comparable or greater. Um, so each deal would have a different pool of investors. Correct. On a historical basis. Um, but but you know in the fund. Um, you know, our, our investors are expecting to see sort of a mid, mid-teens return in the fund. Um, well, you know, if if um, if you if you stuck around if you if you stuck around for lunch uh, two weeks ago and you heard. Mark Vittner, uh, I, I think he said that, um, you guys probably remember better than I did, I think he said 65%, what was it, 65% of the treasury auctions are, are being purchased by the Federal Reserve, um, which, is, which is staggering um, to me. Um, so it sort of tells you there's really not, there's not much of a market uh, for, the, for the treasuries right now. And um, I suppose, you know, I guess, I guess if they stopped doing that, um, interest rates could rise to a, to a level that, that would attract um, um, buyers for, for that debt. Uh, but obviously our, our cost of capital would be much higher. Um, so I, you know, I don't know, I'm not, I'm sure if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question or not, but um, it's, um, it's a little disconcerting. For sure, uh, we've got to you know we've got to figure out a way to at some point we've got to stop. I mean, we can't you, know, you can't continue uh, the way we're the way we're going with with uh, we can't fund sixty five percent of our borrowing. We can't borrow the money we're borrowing on a sustained basis. So I don't know. Hope uh, hope the guys in Washington figure it out soon. Good president. <laughs> That's right, whoever that may be. All right, anything else? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, you're pretty much in the southeast region. Um, do you ever look at, or do you ever have you're targeting any other regions that you feel are going to have growth as good as yours or better, or do you just want to stay in that one particular region? Um, you know, for, for now, um, we've got our hands full just covering that region, um, so I, I wouldn't rule it out. I wouldn't say that, that at some point in the future that, that we don't move into other markets, um, but, but today I think there's, there's um, you know, for our capacity from a human and capital standpoint, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of opportunity for us in, in those markets that we're, that we're targeting. Um, but I could, you know, I could see us a, a few years from now if we kind of stay on the track that we're on and continue to grow, that we start looking into to other markets. And I and and I think we would focus, and we would continue to focus in the South. You know, maybe we'd move into Texas. Um, you know, I mean, there's great great opportunity, a lot of growth in, in in that market for sure. But we'd look for markets with the same sort of characteristics where we think there's population and job growth. That's a, that's a great question, and I think I kind of skipped over when I was talking about the, um, the definition of, of uh, a closed-end private equity fund. Closed-end um, means that once you put your money in, you're in. You're in until we liquidate the fund. There are open-ended funds where you can, you can come in and, you know, and come in and go out. Um, we don't think that that's a good um, structure for real estate just because real estate's 
you know, it's it's a it's sort of a long term investment. I mean, it's not you know, it doesn't fluctuate up and down in value like like a like a stock does. So it, it doesn't really lend itself to uh, to investors coming in and, and coming out. Um, and and then in, in our case, we um, we have a uh, a four-year investment horizon. So from the day that we start raising capital, which was September of last year, we've got four years to invest whatever capital we raise. And then um, the fund, the life of the fund ends after seven years. So, you know, we've got, we have to have liquidated um, all the ass assets within seven years. And different funds have different terms. Well, in our in our case, um, it's it's the it's the, the real estate. So you know, we're when we say we when we're buyers of just distressed debt, there are there are a lot of people, a lot of investors who who buy the debt to own the debt. You know, don't trade the debt. We don't have any interest in that. We it's it's nothing more for us than a vehicle to get ownership of the real estate. Um, so we only buy whole loans. We won't buy a we won't buy a mezzanine or a you know a B piece or a tranche. We want we want whole loans. We want we want to know that we've got a first priority security in the property so that you know, like you were talking about um, you're asking about you know how long does it take to get the property back. We're okay with knowing that it might take a long time, but we want to know we're going to get the property back. And, and uh, unless you buy uh, whole loans and you get and you know you've got that perf that perfected lien on the property, um, you don't know that you can do that. So that's that's what we target. So it's all about the real estate. Um, are there ever any private equity groups that have? open-ended real estate funds because the way I think, uh, you know, there's a downturn, investors would want their money out, and then the fund manager would be in a position where he had to liquidate uh, assets at the absolute worst time. There's a lot of them. Really? Yeah, there's a lot of them. And, and uh, when, things, when things really got bad in, in um, you know, 07, 08, uh, I mean, people were just lining up trying to get their, their money out, and, and, and they couldn't, and there were lawsuits and uh, uh, it was a mess uh, but but there's a lot of them you allow your investors to sell, to sell their actual shares whatever to another investor and you, you guys just transfer that on stake to the other person as long as the same amount still there no okay. no you if you know if you if you uh, if you come into one of these funds, you invest in one of these funds, you're you're in. Um, you're in for the duration, which is you know it's a good thing, um, certainly from our perspective, because um, the type of investor who is going to do that, they've got the wherewithal to do it, right? I mean they're they're liquid, they've got the capital to to invest, and they know you know you don't make that investment. You know, unless you know you can live with it for the term when you make it. Sure. So um, there's a couple of ways. Um, uh, first and foremost, uh, we we invest. You know, we invest our dollars side by side. With um, with our investors, and um, in this particular fund, um, we're putting about 15% of the um, of the total investment in. You know, with our our group of eight within the company and and uh, some family members as well. So we get the same return on that capital that that our that our partners do. And then we we have what's um, known as a promoted interest, so that once our investors achieve a certain return, then instead of those dollars coming out on on a peri pursue basis, where you know everything 
everything would be coming out 8515. Once our investors achieve a certain return, then it, it, it flips and, and we get another 20%. So the dollars start coming out 6535. So we get 20 plus our 15. So if we do a, if we do a really good job and we make good investments, we get a, a promote. The other thing that, that, um, that we do and, and, and we don't really make money um, but it's a revenue source is, is, is the fund, you know, so all those services that I showed you on that, on that pie chart, you know, we get paid for those services. We get paid market fees for property management, leasing, asset management. Um, as I said, it's not, you know, it, it's, and that's really, so we've got, we've got 95 people in this company. It's, those are the revenues that we use to pay the salaries, to pay the overhead. Um, but really, I mean, we're, we're making our money alongside our investors, and if we if we if we do a good job, we're incented. Three inches of capital gain over here. <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know, you're asking me a question. You know the answer to. That's a that's a hot topic. Uh, I don't know. You might have a better idea where that's where that's going. Um, I certainly think it should be a capital gain, um, but we'll, we'll see. How long do you see kind of this stretch in multifamily kind of running on for it, especially down the south floor? It's really hot right now. Do you see that span continuing on five, ten years, or like, well, yeah. we'll first at some point? You know, I mean, I've, I've been doing it long enough to know that I don't know. Um, I think, you know, if you look at if you look at the fundamentals that that I was talking about, I, I think I feel I feel comfortable that there's a um, there's a at least a two year window. You know, if you just sort of look at um, the number of new construction starts on a historical basis, um, even with all the, I mean, and there's a there's a lot of new multifamily construction that's starting. There's a lot of new projects. You know, you see them, you see them everywhere. Um, even with all of those starts on a historical basis, it's much lower than, than it has been in the past. And um, and then when you consider what's going on with home ownership and uh, the fact that fewer people, you know, even people who have the wherewithal to own a home, a lot of people just don't want to. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys think. I mean, you're. You're about to. You're going to be graduating here soon, and, and you know, you're going to make a, be making a decision about where you live. You know, and a lot of that will depend on where you find a job. Would you buy a house? You know, would, would, you, know, would you would you make that bet today, or or, or would you rather be a renter? Um, it's kind of a kind of an interesting question, but and I, and I think you know, a lot of uh, you know, a lot of people too. This job market is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm unusual. I mean, the fact that I, sent, I spent 25 years in the same company, that just doesn't happen anymore. People are more mobile, you know, so you might be in a job for a few years and then you get another job offer. You know, you might be working in Miami, you get a job offer in Atlanta. Well, owning a house is, is, um, can be a bit of a, an albatross, you know, so now you've got you to gotta sell that house. So I think that comes into play, too, you know, there's factors like that. So I, I think that, um, I think there's still some, some room to, to run. 10 years, I, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Another question from anyone? Jim, thank you so much. Thank you. I really, really appreciate it.